think of anybody better to answer that question than our good friend Julian Huxley. And he can tell us all about evolution. He wrote down a definition which was pretty well the standard definition when I was a student. Evolution, in the extended sense, can be defined as a directional and essentially irreversible process occurring in time which in its course gives rise to an increase of variety and an increasingly high level of organization in its products. Our present knowledge indeed forces us to the view that the whole of reality is evolution, a single process of transformation. Well, that is a completely overarching philosophy. It explains everything. The whole of reality is evolution. In the beginning, there was nothing. And then that nothing exploded into everything. Well, actually, it was only gas to start with, but there were thousands of millions of billions of trillions of tons of it. And that gas came together to form stars, and in the stars, there were nuclear reactions which produced heavier elements all the way up to oxygen. And then some of them exploded, and in the explosion they produced the even heavier elements. And then all these elements flying around in space happened to come together to form the Earth. And then on the Earth, some of those atoms and molecules happened to come together to form a living organism. And then just by chance, they got better and better. What a satisfying story. It answers all the big philosophical questions. Like, for example, why <coughs> is there something instead of nothing? Well, originally there was nothing, but it exploded into everything. What's the meaning of life? Oh, there isn't any meaning to life. Life is just an accident. It just came out of an explosion. Will I be called to account for what I've done in this life? No, you can do what you like. Everything just happens by chance and you're your own boss. What happens after death? Well, life is just chemical reactions and once the chemical reactions stop, it's over. You just become compost. That's it. Finish. So you can see why Richard Dawkins said Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You've got answers to the big philosophical questions. They may not be very happy answers, but at least they are answers. But it soon became plain there were slight problems with that overarching story. John Maddox, the chief editor of Nature, the top journal of science, said in all respects, save that of convenience, the Big Bang is thoroughly unsatisfactory. There are so many things wrong with it. One wonders how it ever got started. And Brian G. Wallace in the Fast of Physics pointed out that the Big Bang theories fit all of Langmuir's rules for pathological science. Well, actually, it must surely be the most foolish theory that has ever passed off as science. In the beginning, there was nothing, and then it exploded. Well, you know, we've watched many explosions. Every single one of them has destroyed information, order, and structure. But this one, which nobody saw, produced all the information, order, and structure in the entire universe. Every other explosion we've seen, it needed something to go bang. This one, there was nothing to go bang. So altogether, it is really a very unsatisfactory story. And uh, I think the evolutionists very soon realized they couldn't maintain a a really high stand and say, look, our, our story is impregnable when the Big Bang is so flimsy. So other definitions 
had to be found. Now, a very popular one for quite a while was one that was agreed to by Bertrand Russell and Bishop Huddleston for their famous debate on evolution. And this definition became pretty well standard for quite a long time. Evolution is a continuous, naturalistic, mechanistic process by which all living things have arisen from a single living source, which itself arose by a similar process from a non-living, inanimate world. Well, that was a satisfactory definition that lots of people accepted for a long time, but there is a problem. This inanimate matter, this inanimate world, this dust and water and air and things, in order to produce the simplest living organism, they have to organize themselves into an extremely complex entity. And the problem with that is that the best tested law of science, the one which has absolutely no hint of refutation ever is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says, in effect, things go from good to bad and bad to worse, and only from bad to worse. This story about evolution says things go from bad to good and from good to a whole lot better. So. There's a problem there. It contradicts the best established law in the whole of science, the second law of thermodynamics. Well, for a long time, evolutionists said, no, it doesn't, because, you see, the second law of thermodynamics only applies to a closed system. You've got everything locked in, but the world is not a closed system. We've got the sun streaming its energy into us. And the sun's energy makes a difference. That is a pretty pathetic story. But many evolutionists have put forward that story. And it's got them into embarrassing situations. For example, a few years ago, I was at Stellenbosch University giving uh, some lectures there. And there was a member of the biology department, a certain Dr. Brink, who stood up and contradicted me. And he said, the second law of thermodynamics only holds for closed systems. It does not apply on Earth because we've got the sun coming in. And behind him was one of his colleagues from the chemistry department. And he said, Corbus, I'm a chemist. I work with the second law of thermodynamics all day long. He's right. You're wrong. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so because so many evolutionists have got themselves looking so foolish, Dr. John Ross, an evolutionist himself, but a chemist, and he said the second law of thermodynamics applies equally well to open systems. There is somehow the notion that the second law of thermodynamics fails for such systems. It's important to make sure that this error does not perpetuate itself. It's important because all the time that evolutionists were saying that it doesn't apply, they were making fools of themselves, much to the embarrassment of those who knew better. But we've now got a problem, because if you admit that evolution contradicts the second law of thermodynamics, then you face what Arthur Eddington said, and everybody agrees with him, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in the deepest humiliation. Well, that sounds like the end of the theory of evolution, doesn't it? Has it collapsed in deepest humiliation? I don't think so. You see, what happened was all <coughs> they did was change the definition. And nowadays, you won't find a biology textbook with a definition of evolution anything like what we've looked at before. You will find this definition. Evolution is a change in the gene pool of a population over time. Explanation. 
A gene is a heredity unit that can be passed on and altered for many generations. The gene pool is the set of all genes in a species or population. Now, that isn't really such a big deal, is it? And this certainly doesn't give you a philosophy that can answer those big questions, can it? It can't even tell you where the gene pool came from. You start off with the gene pool, you start off with the population, and then all evolution is, is changing the genes. Well, genes and the gene pool change all the time. At every conception there is a change in the gene pool. Every time there is a mutation which leads to an offspring with no hair or no eyes or deformed arms or some other problem, it's a change in the gene pool. In which case, who can doubt that evolution is true? Well, that's fine, yes, but, but, but what about the story that we all know about? What about Darwin and his life starting in some warm little pond and then progressing, getting better and better through natural selection. You know, that's not evolution today. Evolution is only change in the gene pool, at least if you come to debate with anybody who is a biologist. Now, they're quite happy for you to think of this as evolution. But if you get them in a corner, they will say, oh no, this isn't evolution, this is the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. Aha. Well, what's the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution? Now, that is called the modern synthesis. And it was synthesized by three famous biologists. Julian Huxley, Theodosius Dobzhansky and Ernst Mayer. They arrived in America. Dobzhansky came from Russia, Mayer from Germany, Huxley from England in about 1930. And they got together as the top evolutionary biologists and synthesized the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. Well, Professor Arthur Lodge had a job to get a definition of the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. After all, if you haven't got a definition, then you know, how can one say what it is? Well, being a respected scientist at a prestigious university, he went among the experts to find out who better than one of the three original theorists. Well, unfortunately, Julian Huxley and Theodosius Dobzhansky died in 1975. <coughs> the only one left at that time was Ernst Mayer, the top authority on the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. And what did he have to say about it? Darwinism is not a simple theory that is either true or false but is rather a highly complex research program that is continuously being modified and improved. You know, that's not a very satisfactory definition, is it? And is that what they're teaching our kids in the school these days? It's a theory which is neither true nor false. Well, it sounds like Schrodinger's cat in limbo. It's neither dead nor alive until you look at it, and then it's one or the other. But which is this? It's something sort of hanging in limbo. It's neither true nor false. Um, and it's constantly being changed. Well, that's not a very satisfactory definition, is it? Well, he then went on to Francisco Ayala, who is one of the most respected evolutionists today. And he said the modern theory of evolution is an amalgam of well-established theories and working hypotheses. Oh. Other 
people have called this an amalgam, this amalgam, a smorgasbord. It's a whole collection of theories and hypotheses that you can pick out of here and there as you want. Well, Arthur Lodge asked Ayala, he said, well, look how many of these hypotheses and theories are there in this theory of evolution. Ayala could not tell him. If you can't even find out how many of these hypotheses and theories are in it, how can you understand what it is? How can you know anything about it? Well, that problem was brought up by Colin Patterson, the senior paleontologist at the British Museum, when he delivered a keynote address at a meeting of at the American Museum of Natural History. And he asked the question, he said, can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Any one thing, any one thing that is true. Now, if he had been speaking to a group of uh, our standard five, grade seven school children, I'm sure every one of them would have put their hand up and told him at least a dozen things they had read in their textbook. But he was speaking here to the people who write the textbooks. And not one of them could tell him one single thing they knew to be true about the theory of evolution. He asked the same question at the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar at the University of Chicago. He described that as a group of very influential uh, evolutionists. And he said for a long time there was no answer. And eventually one person piped up and said, well, I do know one thing. It should not be taught in high school. And it's now being taught in junior school and certainly in high school. Since nobody can really tell us anything that they know to be true about this theory, let's have another look at it. Now, Darwin said he thought that life probably began in some warm little pond when atoms and molecules came together to form the first living organism. Well, that story received quite a boost in 1953 when Stanley Miller and Harold Urey did a very famous experiment. And the media reported this as if they had almost produced life in a test tube. Now, what actually happened is they did an experiment, but they used the wrong starting conditions. They put in conditions as if the Earth had a very nasty atmosphere of methane and ammonia and hydrogen and uh, things, and no oxygen. And no water either. Some water vapor, yes, but no water. And everybody agrees the Earth has always had water, it's always had oxygen, it's never had a methane, ammonia, or hydrogen atmosphere. So the starting conditions were all wrong. He also went through the wrong procedure if he wanted to try and prove that this could have happened on Earth because the sparks, the radiation, the shock to form amino acids breaks amino acids down faster than it forms them. So he put in a trap to take them out as soon as they'd been formed, which is not the kind of thing that would have happened if this had happened on the early Earth. He got the wrong results. Almost everything that he got was a sludge, a tar. And tar, together with amino acids, stops them forming polymers. It just blocks them all off so they can't do anything. There, was a ton, there were traces of amino acids, just traces, but only two. Now, the idea of this is that if you can produce amino acids, and proteins are made from amino acids, so you can produce proteins. But proteins need 20 different kinds of amino acid. You could produce two. Now, by changing the, the materials that you put in his experiment, you can get other amino acids. Some combinations, you can get three or four. And if you go across all the methods that have been tried, you can get quite a few, but you can't get all 
the 20, whatever you do. And then there were racemic mixtures. Life can only use left-handed amino acids. These are half left-handed, half right-handed. So even if they haven't got the tar, even if everything else was all right, they still couldn't make proteins. And he had no water here, because water makes everything go the wrong way. So everybody who was concerned with these experiments on the beginning of life very, very quickly realized this experiment told them life could never have formed on Earth. But the story that we find in the textbooks, in the media, in the films and the videos, it's that life started in an ocean of prebiotic soup. And yet everybody who's concerned knows that as soon as you've got some free water, there's no chance because the the amino acids fall apart in water. So this whole story is known to be nothing more than a fairy story. And the people actually involved in origin of life research looked for completely different solutions. Now, one of the solutions was put forward by Francis Crick, a very famous uh, scientist. He shared the Nobel Prize for his part in unraveling the genetic code. And he proposed a theory called directed panspermia. Well, what's that? Well, you see, in his theory, life didn't start on Earth at all. It started in some far distant planet, which nobody has ever seen, nobody can detect, and nobody can take any measurements on it. That's very convenient, because when it's there, <coughs> You can make whatever conditions you like. You can have whatever gases you want. So on this far distant planet, life there evolves. And it evolves so far that it gets an advanced civilization. And eventually, they put their genetic material on a spaceship. Not necessarily a rocket looking like this. Nobody ever saw them, so we don't know. <laughs> Put on some vehicle and send off their genetic material to Earth, and that's how life got here. Well, that never really became all that popular among the scientists. But the one that did become very popular is called the RNA world theory. And there, we have a world covered with clay, and on the clay, RNA forms itself and it gradually develops until eventually it, it can form life. Now, Gestland and Atkins are two of the top experts in the world on the RNA theory. And in their book called The RNA World, they say it is assumed that a magic catalyst existed to convert a, wait a minute, magic catalyst? Has anyone ever seen a magic catalyst? Has anybody ever seen a magic anything? You know, Einstein said what can be measured is science. <coughs> Everything else is speculation. Nobody has ever measured a magic catalyst. So this is definitely speculation. Now, if we want to get to science, we have to get to measurements, numbers, the acid test of mathematics. Well, I realize that many people are a little uh, frightened of mathematics overall, perhaps, but it's really not that bad. In fact, it's quite fun, really. And for those who have forgotten much of their maths, I just want to briefly run over powers of 10. And as an illustration of powers of 10, I want to take as a basic unit one <coughs> millimeter. We all know what not one millimeter is like. Now, 10 to the power 1 means 1 with 1 zero after it, which is just 10. And we're all familiar with 10 millimeters. 
10 to the back 2 is 1 with two zeros after it. That's 100. And again, we're all familiar with 100 millimeters. But what about going to bigger powers? The distance to the moon, 10 to the 11 millimeters, 1 with 11 zeros after it. Distance to the sun, 10 to the 14, 1 with 14 zeros after it millimeters. That's a lot of millimeters. Then what about the stars? Not the nearest stars, but the average sort of star we can see with the naked eye. If it's as far away as the astronomers believe, then about 10 to the power 22. And then if you've got a powerful telescope, you can see faint smudges of light, which are thought to be island universes all on their own, far away, thousands of millions of stars. And if the universe is as the astronomers think it is, those things are so far away that light, travelling at 300,000 kilometres a second, takes thousands of millions of years to cover all that huge distance to get here. And if that's true, they're at a distance of about 10 to the power 30 millimetres away. Now that is an astronomically huge number. You can't imagine that number of millimeters. You can see why Emil Borel, who is a, an expert on the theory of probability, said odds beyond 1 in 10 to the power 50 have a zero probability of ever happening, and even that gives it the benefit of the doubt. That does not happen. It would be equivalent to you buying Next month, one <coughs> ticket for the national lottery each week and winning every time. Now, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that anybody wins the lottery twice in a row. And if someone did win twice in a row, the police would be there to find out what swindle had been going on. Four times in a row, no chance. There, it, there is no chance of it happening. Now, as soon as you put numbers into the theory of evolution, you see there's a problem. And the evolutionists recognized that themselves. And they called for a symposium to look at the problem. But the Wistar Institute, the famous symposium, called Mathematical Challenges to the Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. And the first technical paper put forward was by Murray Eden, and he showed that if you had all the amino acids needed for proteins in exactly the right proportions, all of them completely covering the earth, so you've got, all you have to do is juggle them to put them together, the chance of making a, bio, a biological protein is one chance in 10 to the power 325. Now, 10 to the 50 is no chance at all. This, it's like the, uh, the chance of buying one ticket in the national lottery every week for six months and winning every single time. This is something that's not going <coughs> to happen. Assembling amino acids into a protein is a complex process. A protein is a string of 20 different kinds of amino acids in this picture, which is a computer-generated picture. Each color represents a different kind of amino acid. Once the, this string, which can be thousands of amino acids long, has been formed, it has to be folded to its shape, and some of them, enzymes, have to be so accurate that they must be right to one atom. Now, an enzyme fits the substrate that it works on, and that fit has to be exact. Because it has to be exact, one can work out a very strict probability of getting it to that shape. Now, the simplest known living organism has about 200 thousand different proteins. And of those, about 2,000 are these special proteins called enzymes. And those enzymes are absolutely 
essential to every living organism. For example, phosphatase speeds up reactions vital for cell signaling by 10 to the 21 times, allowing essential reactions to take place in a, hun in a hundredth of a second without it, it would take a trillion years. Well, a living organism cannot wait for a trillion years for something to happen. It's got to happen quickly. And every one of the 2,000 enzymes is essential because if you have to wait a trillion years for one thing, it doesn't matter how fast the others can work, you've got to wait for a trillion years. You need them all, and you need them all perfect at once. Well, Fred Hoy looked into this problem. A very skilled scientist and a very proficient mathematician, and he found that just to produce those 2,000 <coughs> enzymes needed by the simplest known living organism, the probability was one chance in 10 to the power 40,000. Now, I wrote that out longhand, and it takes 13 pages of zero. Now we're talking about the probability <coughs> of winning the national lottery every week for 50 years. Now, at the top here, I have written out 10 to the 80 longhand. But why should I be interested in 10 to the power 80? Well, the reason is that it's believed that in the entire visible universe, in all the stars, all the galaxies, all the clouds of gas and dust, there are at most 10 to the power 80 atoms in the whole universe. 10 to the power 80, one with 80 zeros after it, it takes a line and a third of zeros. Gives you an idea of what 10 to the power 40,000 is like. Well, the problem doesn't stop there for evolution because Harold Morowitz, who is, I think I can safely say, the most respected biological physicist in the world, calculated the, the probability of producing the simplest known living organism, the simplest bacterium, by chance, one chance in 10 to the 100,000 million. Now, if you want to write this number out longhand, write all those zeros, if you can write pretty quickly, and if you're prepared to work 12 hours every day, it will take you just over 600 years just to write the number out. <laughs> I have found that when faced with things like this, evolutionists are a bit less than honest. Now, I've given presentations at universities in many countries, and the biologists there never, never criticize this number. They don't say, oh, that's not true. You see, Morowitz is so well respected worldwide that everybody says, if he calculates that, we accept it. That's what he did. But they say, ah, but you see, there are thousands of millions of years. When I started lecturing, they used to say, there are 2,000 million years over which evolution has been taking place. Nowadays, they say, 4,000 million years. They've found that they've managed to double it some way. Well, supposing they go a bit further, how far can they go? Well, the biggest estimate of the age of the universe that you'll find in any of the scientific literature is 20,000 million years. Most say 15,000 million years. Well, let's be generous and make it 300,000 million years. Does that give us enough time? Well, let's um, look at 300,000 million years. That's 3 times 10 to the 11 years. Now, if we multiply by 365, we get days. Multiply by 324, we get hours, by 60 minutes, by 60 seconds. And this is the number of seconds 
that make up 300,000 million years. And if we approximate 9.46 to 10, then that number is approximately 10 to the power 19 seconds. Nobody believes the universe is that old, and nobody believes that evolution has been going on for anything like this time. But let's be generous and say, well, you've got all those seconds to play with. How does that compare with 10 to the 100,000 million? But they say, oh, but you see, there are lots of other planets scattered throughout the universe. And evolution can be taking place on lots of different planets. So there are many different places. OK, how many different places could there be? The maximum number of places that it could be is wherever there is one atom of matter. That means <coughs> that we, we, can, uh, we can have 10 to the power 80 places that it's going on. Now, as soon as you start looking at the numbers, then you see they don't add up and they say, ah, oh, but we don't know how quickly evolution works. Well, let's suppose that evolution can work as quickly as a supercomputer. And there can be a major advance in evolution every nanosecond. So there are a thousand million major evolutionary advances every second. That means we've got 10 to the 19 times 10 to the 9 is 10 to the 28 nanoseconds in 300,000 million years. And we'll have that going on everywhere where there is one single atom of matter, which is 10 to the 80. So we've got 10 to the power 108. Well, how big a probability do we have to face at every step? Well, it's that divided by that, which is 10 to the power 99,999 million. 999,892. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's quite a small probability, isn't it? It's the probability, approximately, of winning the national lottery every week for 7,100 million years. Well, you can see what I mean when I say they seem to be somewhat less than honest. In Arthur Lodge's searches, Professor Crow said, all living organisms on Earth today are descended from inanimate matter. The process of descent in part one involved very large but unknown numbers of steps, mostly small. Mostly small. It's 10 to the 999,982 a small problem to face. If you listen to Richard Dawkins on From a Frog to a Prince or on Expel, he'll say, oh yes, each of the steps in evolution, it was about the same probability as tossing a coin and getting heads three or four times. That happens all the time. True, it does happen all the time. It doesn't happen all the time that people win the lottery 100,000 million times in a row. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. They're not telling us the truth. I gave some lectures in Chicago a few years ago, and after one of the lectures, I sat down to dinner with an evolutionist from one of the universities in Illinois. He was very unhappy about what I was saying about evolution. And I was saying, but look, you know perfectly well that the stories that they are telling are not true. Why don't you tell people the truth? And I was astounded at his answer. His words were, we cannot tell the public the truth about evolution. They would not understand and would be confused. So that's what the professional evolutionists think of you and me. We are just too dumb to understand. <laughs> so that raises the question, if they're not telling us the truth about evolution, what are they telling us? I 
was giving some lectures in Holland a few years ago, and I was at a place called Delft. And I finished the lecture, and uh, some of the students from the university came and said, not far away, there is a museum which is entirely dedicated to evolution. Would you like to come and have a look? So I went there, and we got into the entrance porch, and this is what is the it's entrance porch. It's a, a big room, maybe three or four times as big as this. And there is an ocean of prebiotic soup with volcanoes flashing and lightning. And the story there about life starting off in this ocean of prebiotic soup. So I said, but this is disproved, disproved nonsense. Nobody believes this anymore. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So I went to find the curator of the museum and said, look, this story that you're putting out here, it's known to be totally false. And he said, well, yes. But if we didn't show them this, what would we have to show them? Now, I uh, used to have a, a friend who also gave lectures like I do. And he gave a lecture at, um, in Cape Town. This would be in about 1990. And he showed <coughs> lots of things that the evolutionists are telling us which are simply not true. Like, for example, the evolution of the horse. Now, the curator of the Cape Town Museum was there. And at the end, he stood up and said, you haven't told us anything new at all. We've known for years that things like the evolution of the horse are not true. So my friend said to him, then can you tell me, please, why do you still have the evolution of the horse demonstration in your museum? Well, he didn't answer, but if he had answered, he would have to say the same thing. Well, if we don't show that, what can we show? This story was disproved years and years ago, but it's still in the textbooks. I looked at some junior school textbooks. What are they doing with evolution? But they're learning about the evolution of the horse. But it was admitted years ago, it's put together from non-equivalent parts, and it's not a sequence at all. But when you look at the school children's work, they're being tested on it, and they get quite good marks. They obviously learnt it well. They learnt it well, and it's been known for years to be nonsense. Well, look at another page. This is actually Graad Sierra Sociale Wetenschap Lerens Gids Module 1. Standard 5, for those who grew up in an earlier time. And look what we've got here. We've got the evolution of man, and it's illustrated by these wonderful skulls. Australopithecus, Africa Artments. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Australopithecus, Australo, Southern Pithecus, ape. Southern ape. It is an ape and nothing else. The skull is that of an ape and nothing else. What's this story about it being an ape man? There are plenty of skulls of Australopithecus. There are plenty of skulls of all sorts of apes. And then we've got Neanderthal. Well, Neanderthal man was a normal man. The early specimens that were found were <coughs> people who had bone diseases, particularly rickets. And so they had some deformities. But there have been plenty of Neanderthals found without such deformities, and they're perfectly normal human beings. There are plenty of perfectly normal human being skulls. But now look at this. Pithecanthropus 4. Pithecus, ape, anthropus, man. Ape man number 4. Now one gets the impression that you get a nice skull like that to look at too with the ape men. That's not the case. All you find is a few little scraps of bone which you reconstruct to make it look like that. Now you'll notice it's Pithecanthropus 4. There are three that went before this one. One of them I don't know, but one of them 
It was constructed from what was said to be a perfect ape man's skull cap. So there was just this little bit here, the perfect ape man's skull cap. It was later discovered to be an elephant's kneecap. <laughs> then the next one wasn't from a skull at all. It was from what was said to be an ape man's collarbone. That was later discovered to be part of a dolphin's rib. And Pithecanthropus IV is usually known as Java Man. That was found by a man called uh, Dubois. And he went to Java specifically looking for an ape man. And he found two human skulls and one giant gibbon skull. And 20 meters away, he found a human leg bone. So he said, aha, this human leg bone goes with this gibbon skull. And so he made up an ape man. Pithecanthropus IV, better known as Java Man. Just look at that skull. You really think this gives the impression you find skulls that you can look at. Well, this is a particularly well-known ape man skull, which has got far more bone than most of the ape man skulls. But here you can see the bone because the bone is dark and the rest is plaster of Paris. Richard Leakey once said, it's mostly imagination. You find a few scraps of bone, very rarely as much as this. It's usually far less. And the rest you have to fill in with your imagination and plaster of Paris. Well, this was uh, a very famous skull. I think there were more than 500 PhD theses written on the position of this skull in the evolution of man from the apes. It had prime position in the British Museum for about 50 years. It was eventually discovered that, that this jawbone is from an orangutan. It had been doctored. And the other bones had been chemically stained to make them look old. But they weren't old. It's a forgery. And so many of them have been found to be forgeries. It is not a joke. Now this is another one. Now this is more typical of the amount of material that ape men are reconstructed from. It was reconstructed from one tooth, and you'll notice that the artist has been careful to include it in his drawing. Now it's not uncommon to reconstruct ape men from one tooth. Perhaps you've heard of Alice of Alicedale and her brother, each reconstructed from one tooth. And the story goes that because there's two like this, the jaw must have been like that to hold it. With such a jaw, the skull must have been like this. And so you reconstruct your ape man from one tooth. It took its place on the family tree of man with the impressive name Hesperopithecus. And there it remained until an identical tooth was found in the jaw of its original owner. Its original owner turned out to be a wild pig. <laughs> so this whole story is, it would be a joke if it were not being presented to our children as true. And they're learning it and believing it. Another thing which is being presented, and I remember when I studied uh, biology at Fitz University <coughs> quite a long time ago, this was one of the most impressive displays in our evolution textbook. This is a set of drawings by Ernst Haeckel showing embryo development. And he shows development from fish, salamander, turtle, all the way through to man. Now, you've heard, I'm sure, about humans having gill slits at one stage in their development. But well, here we've got the embryo of a fish, and you can see these gill slits that it's got. And all the way through all these other things, they're all just the same. They must all have come from fish. Yes. And you can see as things go on, they just gradually differentiate. And now, by this time, oh, now you can see that it really is true. A boy is a pig, is a dog. My, this really is impressive proof for evolution, isn't it? But there's a question. 
Nowadays, we've got photography. Why do we still have Hackel's drawings? Why not show photographs? Now, the trouble is, when you look at photographs of these things at those stages, it's not so impressive, is it? And in fact, if you put them side by side, here we've got Hackel's drawings, here we've got photographs. They're not identical, are they? And an interesting point here, look at this fish embryo. Can you see any trace of Gibson's? How does his drawing come to be like this? And when we come to a human embryo, well, we can see three what are called pharyngeal pouches, where there are structures which grow into the, the jaw and the ear, but Gilson's. Is this really, uh, is, is this really uh, any sort of demonstration of evolution? This is shown in the textbooks, even till today. And if you confront the educational authorities and say, look, this is just deception, they say, no, not at all. Evolution is true. This is just illustrating evolution. How can it be false? And the same thing, this comes again from our grade seven social science. You notice again they have drawings. And just look at this. Hey, that gorilla, he's just like a man, isn't he? He's a bit stronger. But why? He even looks like Uncle Fred. <laughs> and the chimpanzee, oh yes, he's like that chap down the road who's not very bright. But my goodness, yes, you really can see. Sure, you can see evolution there, can't you? Why don't they show photographs? Now, when you look at a real gorilla, it doesn't look quite so impressively similar, does it? You know, gorillas can be trained to stand on their back legs. So can bears, so can dogs, so can horses, especially when they are given something to eat as a reward when they stand on their back legs. But they don't normally. They normally walk on all fours or climb in the trees. And when you look at it like that, it's not quite as convincing as looking at that, is it? And when you look at a chimpanzee instead of that drawing, well, they also always walk on their four legs. They can be trained to walk on two. But when you look at a real chimpanzee, it's not so impressive, is it? It just doesn't give you the same impression that, yes, this definitely demonstrates evolution. What they're showing us is it true? Or is it a story? Can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Any one thing, any one thing that is true? Well, from what I've seen of the school textbooks, the writers also know nothing true because they have to show us false things like Hackel's drawings and those eight men. Is there anything that anybody knows that is true about evolution? Well, I think Soren Lovetrop got pretty close to it. I think he said something true about evolution. He said, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. Now, he's not alone in thinking that. Giuseppe Sermonti, he's professor of genetics at one of the Italian universities, and in an interview with John Stone, he said, if I am interested in combating Darwinism, it's not because it's a false theory. There are many false theories throughout the world. It is because it is dishonest. What shocked me also is that the supporters of Darwinism do not believe it themselves. Now, at that time, Ernst Mayer was doing a tour of Europe. It turned out to be his last tour of Europe because he died afterwards. And he was giving presentations showing evolution's effect. So Jean Stone said, but Ernst Mayer believes it. It's interesting to see what Sir Monty responded. He said, but he is a bishop, a high priest of the theory. He has to give the appearance that he believes it. 
I don't think that once he returns to his room alone with himself, he really believes that little accidental mutations and natural selection could suffice to produce a dinosaur from an amoeba. It is not possible that he believes that. Nobody who knows anything at all about biochemistry could possibly believe that. But he says that. Why? He is a bishop, a high priest of the theory. This has nothing to do with science. This has everything to do with religion. He's a bishop. He's a high priest of this religion, of secular, humanist, secular humanism, which demands evolution as its basis. And all the evolutionists realize this. It's amazing that there are Christians who don't. It's amazing there are Christians who say, oh, well, um, God might have used evolution. The atheists know better. Richard Bozarth, writing in The American Atheist, his article, The Meaning of Evolution. Evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God if Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins and this is what evolution means then Christianity is nothing and wherever you look in the literature the attack is always against Christianity never against Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or anything else. It's always against Christianity. <coughs> there is only one person they hate, Jesus. You won't find them knocking Muhammad or Krishna or Vishnu or Confucius. It's only Jesus that they hate. The lies have no threat to a lie. It's only the truth that has a threat for the lie. Well, we get back to our question that we started with, what is evolution? And I think it probably depends on who you ask. If you were to ask our present Minister of Higher Education, or in fact any of his communist cronies in the government, they will all give you the same answer. They'll say, oh, evolution is a scientific fact which everybody should know because it's true. I think that's not true at all. I'd say it's much more truthful to say it is an attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. Scopes trial, uh, what happened there, and uh, what was discovered afterwards, and just the history about it, because there's a lot of different information. The Scopes trial was organized by the ACLU, deliberately to be a 
protest. Now, the ACLU is quite a well-organized group of atheists who want to get Christianity out of everything and secular humanism into everything. So they organized for a teacher, I think he was actually a PT teacher. And at one stage, he had to take a few biology lessons because the biology teacher was not there. And in that uh, biology uh, stint that he did, he did not teach any evolution. But being a secular humanist, he was very happy to help the ACLU. So they organized that they would have this, um, this trial to break into the school system with evolution. The side for the ACLU withdrew before the judgment because they knew perfectly well the judgment was going to be against them. and that wouldn't be very good publicity. So altogether, it's a very poor story for the evolutionists. But what happened was the secular humanist playwright decided to do what all the Hollywood people do today, and that is change the facts to make it exactly the opposite of the truth. You will find the complete opposite to the truth being put forward. And people who don't know any history, and most people nowadays don't, you don't learn any history at school, and most people never bother to look up any history on their own, then that's what you'll believe. So a playwright wrote a play called Inherit the Wind, in which he had the people against the ACLU as a set of Christian religious bigots who were all utterly wrong and they were completely outclassed in court because the arguments of the evolutionists were so good and the arguments of the Christians were so pathetic that one would think that the Scopes trial had been an absolute victory for evolution. And that is what people nowadays believe, because they never learn any history. They just go and see what Hollywood's telling them and believe that. But the whole Scopes trial was an attempt by the ACLU to, to gain a victory. They lost it. But later, it was turned into a victory by um, a lying playwright. The secular humanist is a master of lying. And why not? After all, if, you're, if your worldview is evolution, evolution happens by the strong killing the weak. It's nature ready in tooth and claw. You get to the top any way you can because it's the winner who, uh, who wins. There's no such thing as morals. You know, they are purely arbitrary. You make up your standards. You decide what's good, what's bad. And getting me to the top is the best. So why not lie? If I can get further to where I want to be by lying, why not? Telling the truth is just a matter of convention. If I choose to, well, all right, but if I choose not to, why not? There is no command from God, thou shalt not bear false witness. For an evolutionist, for anybody, in fact, who's not a Christian, telling lies makes sense. The, the Muslims deliberately tell lies on the understanding that anything that furthers Allah's cause is good, and if lies further his cause, then lies are good. It's only the Judeo-Christian worldview which, which has got the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. 
And if you haven't got that commandment, and if you haven't got it from God, who you know is going to judge you, why should you, uh, why should you think twice about telling a lie? Yes. I just wanted to ask if you're familiar with the articles that have been published like in the past that said that Charles Darwin, when he was on his deathbed, he actually recanted his theory to um, a, a lady, I think it was called, she was called Lady Hall. But then there's some people who refute that he actually recanted, and then there's some people who say that he actually recanted. So it's not quite clear. I was wondering whether you're familiar with those articles and what's your viewpoint on that. Yes, that story. I think has been thoroughly debunked. Now, what surprises me is why anybody should want Charles Darwin to have recanted on his bed, deathbed. Would that do any harm to the theory of evolution? No. I don't think so. It's quite clear from his later works that he had very serious doubts about evolution. He realised that the proof that he had been looking for was not materialising and in fact instead of proofs coming up to, to support it, there was more and more evidence refuting it. But he, he didn't want to let go of it. Now he hated God because I think two of his children had died. Now, it's not really surprising because he married his first cousin and if you marry a close relation then you're going to be uh, genetically in trouble because you're likely to have the same kind of genetic faults. So you're going to have uh, probably problems with your children and two of them clearly were, you know, pretty well disadvantaged by this close mating and they died and he was really angry at God and his attitude was well if God was a God of love he wouldn't have deprived me of my kids I hate him um, you know, the fact that the Bible says you must not marry a close relation and the fact that he had disobeyed that <laughs> he disregarded that it's all God's fault None of it's his fault. And um, I don't think he wanted to recant, because to recant of evolution, then you're back to having to, to acknowledge a creator. So I don't think he ever wanted to acknowledge a creator. And as far as I know, he did not. But I do know that as time went on, he had greater and greater doubts, because there wasn't anything to support the theory and there was so much against it. The textbooks that you showed, was it the fruit textbook? Yes, but they're used uh, throughout the country. The one that I showed is, uh, as far as I can make out, a very popular textbook in, in Afrikaans schools. And this particular school that I got this the one that I illustrated is supposed to be a Christian school anyway. But it is very difficult for a Christian school to operate as a Christian school. There was one here in Bloemfontein and the, um, the headmistress announced that she would have to close the school down because the government makes such demands that it would be impossible to cover a Christian curriculum and cover what they demand. They demand that all children learn all the indoctrination that they want given, and that especially includes evolution. As I looked at the skulls that you showed, I was just wondering what is the effect of evolution on theologies like or ideologies like uh, racism, um, any such thing? Oh yes, huge. Evolution really fuels racism. The Nazis, for example, were quite open in their idolization of Darwin. And they could um, satisfy themselves and openly claim 
that they were helping the progress of man by helping evolution in getting rid of the unfit. And uh, so, as far as they were concerned, it was quite clear that the, the Jews were an inferior race and they should be exterminated. The blacks were inferior, they should be exterminated. Now, Hitler was absolutely thunderstruck and he was absolutely angry when Jesse Owen won a gold medal at the Olympics. When he saw this black man beating the Germans, he was really absolutely outraged because as far as evolution goes, Darwin had said, what's going to happen is the black people are going to die out because they're the next stage up from gorillas and they can't possibly compete with the other races. So he said the blacks will die out and then the nearest relation to, to people will be gorillas. Now, this is just pure Darwinist. He, he wrote a book, The Descent of Man. And in this, you know, he makes it very clear that the Australian Aborigine and the African Negro are the lowest level of evolution. They're just this side of monkeys. And racism burgeoned after um, evolution came in. Until then, all the people in the civilized world were at least nominally Christian. You know, many of them were lukewarm or stone cold, but at least officially and nominally, they were Christian. And the Bible says that God made of one blood all men. So racism is not it's not a, it's not feasible on that worldview. But on an evolutionary worldview, it's not just feasible, it's compulsory. I wonder what the evolutionists would say, because there's a joke that says um, if you came from monkeys or apes, why do we still have apes? <laughs> well, look, the story has changed. Evolutionists nowadays don't say men came from apes. They changed that story about maybe 30 or 40 years ago. They say now that there was an original ancestor which has disappeared. And monkeys came from one branch of his uh, progeny and men came from another branch. So we both come from a common ancestor but we don't come from monkeys. That's not the way it used to be. But now it, it has become a rather, um, shall we say, politically incorrect to be a racist. So now they've changed the story to make it more politically correct. But you won't find that from Darwin. From Darwin, it's, it's apes, gorillas, Negroes, and uh, Austrian Aborigines, and then Chinese, and right at the top, white Europeans. And in, um, in his book, he says nobody could doubt, I can't remember the words, he says nobody could doubt that a black person will ever be able to compete with a white person except in physical strength. And to him it was absolutely perfectly clear. You should read Descent of Man, it's, it's <laughs> quite interesting. Most evolutionists these days are... Um, Embarrassed by it. Philip, what does evolution say about the future? Are we going to evolve into something better? <laughs> well, yes. This is this is why the new age is so popular. Evolution is really a part of the new age, and the people who've got it, they're the ones who are evolving to realize the Christ that is within them. We are on our way to Godhead. At the moment, we're a bit better than monkeys, but we're on our way to God. And this is very a very popular idea among the New Ages. You know, people like to like to think of themselves as being gods, 
What was the way Satan got Adam and Eve to sin? You will be as gods. You look at Buddhists, what are they aiming at? They're aiming to get away from this body, this human, this, this human form, which is just a, a prison. We want to come out and be God uh, uh, in, in unison with the, the great spirit of the universe. We ourselves will unite with this God. It's a, it's a great idea that Satan has always put forward. Just think you can be like God. Ooh, wonderful. You don't have to be submitted to it. Oh, wonderful. I can be my own boss. I can be the God. You know, it's something that man loves. So they don't like you, but they want to be like you. They well, don't believe in you, but they don't want to be you. It's only the God of the Bible they hate. Uh, no, I don't know if, you, if you've seen the film Expelled. Well, you should have a look. In it, uh, Ben Stein interviews quite a lot of people, including evolutionists, and one of them is Richard Dawkins. And um, at one stage, he says to him, Richard Dawkins, well, I think you said that um, God is not a very good character. And he said, oh, I said far worse than that. And he opened his book, and it said it's something like, the God of the Bible is the worst character in the whole of fiction. <laughs> Although the most hateful character in the whole of fiction. He really hates God. He's quite happy with the other ones. He's quite happy with the Buddha and Krishna and Vishnu and all that kind of thing. But as far as God goes, he, he, he's a very interesting example of the way it's impossible to be consistent as an atheist. Now, I maintain that there are two possibilities. You either have to accept the creation was created by a creator, or the creation created itself. If you believe the creation was created by a creator, then the only logical thing to do is to seek and find who is that creator. And I've come across plenty of people <coughs> who have done this. And anybody who looks genuinely will find the God of the Bible, because the Bible is the only book which is consistent. The God of the Bible is the only God who is consistent. So if you actually want to seek the truth in that worldview, you must end up at the Bible and the God of the Bible. On the other hand, if you opt for the creation created itself, then there is no God. And if you are consistent in that, you have to end up over here. There is no God. And over this side, there's only one place you can be. There is the God of the Bible, and his creation is his. Now, I claim to stand over here. And in all the, the things that I look at, in biology, in geology, in astronomy, whatever I look at, I am quite convinced that I can hold a completely consistent position here in my circle, standing on the Bible. Now, the other side, the only consistent way it can be in that circle, there is no God, and that's it. So you have to believe evolution. You have to believe something like the Big Bang. And about the most consistent person that I've found over here is Richard Dawkins. And here he stands and he shouts, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. But then you listen long enough and he says, there is no God, there is no God, and I hate him. <laughs> I don't believe it is possible to be here and be consistent. There's only one consistent position. It's here, standing on the Bible. 
just wonder why they keep believing it if they actually know it's not true. Deep in their hearts, they know it's not true, it can't be. And then why they, they just go and seek the truth or accept it? Well, that, that is a very interesting question. A few years ago, before the KGB threw me out, I used to lecture very, very often in Russia, and particularly in universities. And I gave a lecture to the biology department at the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. And there are really top people there really well qualified people and it was one of the first lectures which my special interpreter was with me for. Now from then on she accompanied me throughout Russia for years but she was still sort of new to it and after this lecture and the question and answer she came to me puzzled and she said but this is amazing these are clever educated men and yet the questions they ask and the way they respond to what you have said shows that it, it's not possible that they can believe what they're saying. She said, I must go and ask them. And she came back and she said, well, yes, they told me they know perfectly well that it's not true. But they just haven't found an alternative that they want to believe. If if you want to believe a lie, you will. And I believe it's even worse than that. Even if you don't want to believe it. Because if you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter 2, about, about verse 10, it says, because they did not want to believe the truth, God sends them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, if God sends them that delusion that they should believe the lie, then what can you do to open their eyes? There's only one way to open their eyes. You've got to get them to stop hating the truth. If you can bring them to accept the gospel, then those lies lose their power. If God no longer sends them that delusion, then their eyes can be opened. When I was an atheist, I believed all this nonsense, like the Big Bang and evolution. You know, I believed all of it. When I became a Christian, it was still there, all this baggage that I had. But now, as I saw the evidence, I was able to say, hey, but look, this shows what I was believing was not true. But before I came to the Lord, before he saved me, I could look at evidence which was absolutely against what I was being told and not see it. I'd like to know, do you think that there will come a point in time where Christianity will be brought back into schools and if religion will be phased out or not? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. I believe that life as we know it cannot last much longer. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. And one of them, one, one simple reason, is that because of genetic error catastrophe, all life is going sterile. And among humans, the measurements that have been taken show sterility increasing at 1.5% per year. That's pretty well worldwide. You cannot have sterility increasing at 1.5% per year and not have a totally sterile population in the not too distant future. Now, Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith upon the earth? But if he doesn't come back fairly soon, he won't find life on the earth. So we don't have a vast amount of time ahead of us. Now, the time it would take 
to come to the bottom of the slope that society is heading for, to hit the bottom and then start to climb back up. It, is, it can't happen in 10 years, it can't happen in 20 years, it can't happen in 50, I should think. If one looks at what happens in the Bible, when people become so corrupt, they really hit the downward slope. When they hit the bottom, it takes 70 years before they can start to rebuild and get on the right track again. I would suspect that once our society hits the bottom, again, it would take 70 years before it started to rebuild. And I doubt if society has got that long before sterility is such a problem that we don't have a future to look forward to. I, I personally believe that it cannot be all that much longer before Jesus returns. Now, I think it's very foolish to give a prediction and say, well, it must come in the next five years, or it must come in the next ten years, or it must come in the next twenty years. But the way things are, it seems obvious that he must come soon. And also, when you look at the way society is becoming so utterly evil, throughout the world you find unborn babies being murdered by the thousands every day. In South Africa, in the last, how long is it since they legalized abortion here, there have been more than a million babies killed. Um, you look at uh, everything about the way society is going, the way that there is just no respect for human life. Murderers are not punished. Hardly, hardly any criminals are, are uh, punished. They are being reformed, not, not punished. The way society on the whole is becoming so corrupt, when you look back in the past, what happened when society became so corrupt that they were just doing evil all the time? God came with a judgment. Now, the Bible says God is going to come with another judgment, this time by fire. But if God came with his judgment on the people in the days of Noah, when they became so evil and corrupt. How can we not think that he will come when this generation has become so evil and corrupt? Now, if you look back in the Bible, there seems to be one sign that consistently crops up when there's going to be a major judgment. And that is when homosexuality spreads through the society. Now, I personally don't, I, I don't say that homosexuality is in any way a worse sin than any other. But it seems to be an indicator. And when we reach the stage where homosexuality is spreading through society and taking over, you see God coming in judgment. And this is happening in our society at such a rate that it's astounding. There are uh, teachers being prepared to go around all the schools <coughs> as couples, men with men, women with women, as showing uh, themselves as role models for the children, as homosexuals. If you look at what is being taught in their sex education, it is all perversion and very strongly homosexual orientated. And this to me is a, uh, a thing that uh, opens my eyes. I, I, because if you go through the Bible, when you see homosexuality spreading through a society, it's time for a great disaster. And it's clear 
that the judgment is coming in the not too distant future. We are rushing towards it. And I suspect that judgment is going to come before we hit the bottom and start climbing up to a decent society again. Um, I'm just curious, when these people, or the components of the theory of evolution, they are trying to stamp out the concept of God or the concept of Jesus, um, what is their take on the existence of Satan? When you were an atheist, did you have any um, belief in the force, the negative force of Satan, or what was your view on Satan? No, my my view was that all such spiritual stories were myths and fairy stories. Now, the people who are actually the prime movers of the descent of our society away from Christianity are not atheists at all. The atheists are what the communists call useful idiots. The people who are really running the show and directing things are not atheists at all. They call themselves Luciferians. Now, Christians tend to call them Satanists, they would never call themselves Satanists because you see to them, Lucifer is the good God and Jesus is the bad guy. So if anybody's Satan, it's Jesus and Lucifer is the good guy. So well, the people who are at the top running the show are not atheists at all. They worship Lucifer. Now, I have known a number of them, and it's very sad to contrast their dedication with Christians. I used to know one very well. I knew him before he got saved, and I knew him when he got saved, I knew him for quite a while after he got saved. <coughs> and he said, when he served Lucifer, he spent three hours a day on his knees before Lucifer. And he said all his people in the worship of Lucifer did the same thing. Now, how many Christians do you know who spend half an hour a day on their knees before Jesus? I just don't get how somebody, especially if they've been exposed to the biblical teachings, could see Lucifer as the good God and of God, oh Jesus is the bad God. Oh, wow. Are they then themselves deceived by Lucifer somehow? Because if you look at um, people like Anton LaVey, who started the Church of Satan, he believes that he was going to rule in hell with Satan. So then you'll see that among Satanists themselves there is some deception. Well, yes, he was a Satanist. He was originally um, just a normal witchcraft person. Now, when you get into witchcraft, you are told there are a whole stack of gods and goddesses. It's only when you get quite far that you're told, well, actually, that's just a story we tell the stupid people when they get in. There's actually only one god, and it's Lucifer. But their story is, the god of the Bible is a miserable, prescriptive fellow who wants you to do just what he says. And he'll punish you if you don't. Lucifer came along and freed man from all those dreadful laws. Lucifer gives you freedom. You don't have to obey, the, obey those commandments. Why should you? Why should you do what he says? Why should you fear that if you don't do it, you're going to burn in hell? And if you do what he says, you're going to get promoted and be be happy. This is nonsense. I will set you free from his laws. Um, I can't remember, it might have been Anton LaVey who said, um, do what you want to do, this is the sum total of the law. And uh, Alistair Crowley, that's right, Alistair Crowley. Um, this is what Lucifer lets you do. He gives you freedom. All those laws that God gave, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
And now when Satan had come along, and when Lucifer had come along and he set people free, and now they were living a life of freedom, this miserable Jesus comes along and wants to enslave them to God's laws again. He really is the bad guy. He's going to get you back to where you were, having to obey God's laws. Oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Oh, I'll get punished if I don't. That's why he's the bad guy and Lucifer's the good guy. He lets you do whatever you want. You want to get drunk? Fine, go ahead. You want to go and seduce the neighbor's wife? Fine, why not? Nothing wrong with it at all. Have fun. He's the good guy to people who want to live in sin. So, for the previous question, did you say um, before we really hit that slump or the level, we might have the opportunity to rebuild, sort of, and before that, God will come or Jesus will come for the second time? Yes, I believe that the pattern that's shown in the Bible, in God would not be consistent if he did not come in judgment soon. And he tells us there will be a judgment, but this time it will be a judgment by fire. Now, it's going to be pretty, pretty ter terrible, but not well, hallelujah. He knows best. Maybe I'm just asking, sorry, that because I'm scared, you know, because I think most of us are scared for that happening, even though I'm saved. But um, then I want to, I think what I actually want is, let's take another chance and rebuild. But at some stage, Jesus will come again. So at some stage, there won't be any rebuild, and it will happen. Well, I think every Christian should be doing everything he can to rebuild everything around him and the people around him. But Jesus said, that many will seek, but few will find. And that includes in the churches. He said on, the, on that day, many will say, but Lord, we heard you speaking to us. We ate and drank with you. You know, they've obviously been taking the Lord's Supper. They've obviously been listening to the sermons and confident. God speaking to them, and they've been looking at their Bible, reading it, confident God speaking to them. And they're absolutely amazed when he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. There is a church today, the vast majority of the church has no respect for judgment. They have no fear of God's judgment, and sin is something to be taken lightly. You know, sins to be taken lightly. God's loving God is going to forgive me. And on that day, the vast majority of the church is going to say, But Lord, we thought we were there. And he says, there will be few who make it. There will be many who say, But Lord, Lord, we ate and drank with you. And he says, I never knew you. So it's no good thinking that there's going to be the whole world brought to the truth. To get there, you've got to enter the narrow gate. And he said, there are few who enter the straight gate. So we should be trying to rebuild as much as we can around us drawing as many as we can around us. But I don't think we should fool ourselves that we are going to become the majority. I was just wondering on the, on the witchcraft, um, as you mentioned, um, yesterday the world was shocked with uh, Columbine shootings there. And then recently, locally in South Africa, we had the guys from Creers uh, Dorp. Yeah. That, that cut with the panga and we had the lady now from Belgium and so forth. Um, is there a linking as well? Um, 
it seems like, like these kinds of things among schools uh, is dramatically increasing. Does evolution play a part in that? Or is Very it much so. Very much so. And what plays a great part is the pathetic state that the church has got itself into. If, if you consider, for example, the situation in Europe before the gospel got there, The place was completely ruled by the Druids. Because the Druids had the power. And people simply dare not go against them. It's much like uh, it's been in Africa for a vast amount of time. The witch doctors are so powerful, you don't cross them. And you don't do things which will make your neighbor go to the witch doctor to cast a spell on you. Because this is just very bad. It's, it's dangerous to get on the wrong side of spiritual powers. So Europe was pretty well in the bondage of the Druids because they had so much power. When the Christians came, they came in the power of Jesus, and the Druids' power was broken. They couldn't exercise their power that they had been, been using. So people, seeing who was the stronger power, turned to Christ. And it was a, a real demonstration of power that led people to the power. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I didn't come with uh, skillful words and oratory. I came with power. But the church today hasn't got any power because the church today hasn't got much in the way of faith. In those days, the people had the Bible, which they believed absolutely the word of God, Today the church has got the Bible which most ministers don't even believe. The theological colleges don't teach their pastors that the Bible's true. Not at all. They teach them that it's developed from Babylonian myths and it's fairy stories. Well, without the Bible and a complete trust in it, a Christian has no power at all. And we see a totally powerless church. And what does everybody do? Well, they're now hungry for spiritual power. There's none in the church. There's plenty in witchcraft. So people are flooding to witchcraft. But does God himself still operate the way that he used to operate in the olden days, when people um, could hear directly from God and they seemed to have a very close relationship to God, and people walked with God back like then? Can we still get that um, in these days? Because it seems to me that like, when you want to communicate with God, you hear from God through prophets or through pastors or through your ministers. Yeah. And it just seems to be lost the type of relationship people had back then. I don't see it today. True, you have to look very carefully today. You, there are still people like that, but there is a difference. You see, they were prepared to seek. The Bible says, you will seek me, and you will find me, if you seek for me with all your heart. Now, you go and find people like that, and you will find the power of God. I personally have spent time with one man under whose ministry, as far as I remember, seven people have been raised from the dead. At one service, ten blind people received their sight. And there was one blind person who wanted to go to the service, but he couldn't get any transport. So he, 
he was very uh, sad, but he just waited by the side of the road. And at the same time that the others received their sight, he received his. Um, this, so this kind of thing still happens, but the cost is still the same as it always was. What did it cost Paul to have the power he had? Everything. He said everything that was gained to him, he counts as dumb. Are we prepared to count everything in our life as dumb in comparison to the power of God in our life? The few people that I have come across who have that same attitude have the same power. And the few people that I have come across like this, every one of them believes every word in the Bible is God breathed and the total truth. Just on the issue of um, the miracle workers that you mentioned in that, and how do you differentiate between genuine miracle workers and the type that you see on TV that are like, shrouded in controversy? Like if I have to mention the Benny Hens or the Renan Bonkers, they also in a way perform miracles and claim to be of God, but then there's a lot of controversy surrounding them. And I'm thinking also, like, if I have to think in terms of the Bible, with the seven sons of Stephen were also like performing miracles, but they couldn't. So, yeah, but like, basically, like when somebody confesses, like, okay, they're using God's power as well to perform miracles, how are you going to differentiate? Because now, I'm just wondering if you're basing it on miracles, that the, the fact that they have a relationship with God, you're basing it on miracles, whereas someone who's not. Um, a true person, a true follower of God, and also perform the same miracles. Well, when I first got converted, I joined a Pentecostal church. And there's lots and lots of talk there about the power of the Holy Spirit. Lots of talk about gifts and power. And lots of Sort of demonstration, but nothing that really seemed to have really genuine. Nothing. Now, when I met people who really had power, they never talked about the sort of things that the Pentecostals talked about. They didn't talk about the gifts of the Spirit. They didn't talk about uh, prophecy and speaking in tongues and healing they just preached the gospel now most of the miracles that happened at the particular place that I'm thinking of did not happen because someone prayed for someone to uh, be healed it happened when, under convi the conviction of the preaching, people fell on their knees before God and confessed their sins. Now, if you go to the Pentecostal meetings, do you find the message, you must repent? I once went to a, a Pentecostal camp. It was all the assemblies of our denomination. <coughs> and uh, it was typical happy clappy stuff. Very nice, very pleasant, very nice. And, and one of the pastors, he had, um, he had a, an opportunity to give a, a devotion. And he gave a completely different message. He said, Friends, the Lord has shown me a vision of the highway of holiness. And I can see that highway of holiness, and I can see we are not on it. There are things between us and that highway, things like houses and cars, and money. And we're close, but we're not there. And 
I was struck by this, and I think you know he's right. We are pretending we are where we are not. And all these things he's talking about, that's what's interesting us. And that is what's keeping us away from being where we should be. And I thought, my, we need to get on our knees and seek God's mercy. But instead, the head of the nomination immediately jumped on the stage and said, thank you, brother, for that uh, sermon. Isn't it wonderful to be sons of the kingdom? Let's sing, we are heirs of the kingdom. And I thought, my goodness, how could, how could this just wash over him? And it was all back to being happy, clappy again. And the Lord had shown us the truth. We are not there. We don't want to hear it. Is there like an indication of the growth of like illusions? Like are they growing? Like for instance for Christianity, they're continually growing. Is there like a percentage of evolutionists? And another question, why do they have so much control? Like they move into a into the school sector and they change the textbooks and everything. Why do they have so much control? Because the Christians are so lukewarm. The only reason <coughs> that Satan is rampant, rampant on the earth is because the Christians are fast asleep.